So, Happy New Year. <laughs> it's going to be a long, hard morning, folks. <laughs> so, there was uh, a couple weeks ago, my uh, alarm went off. It was 6 a.m., and uh, it had been a rough week and night. And, uh, and uh, so, uh, sometimes when it goes off, it's set for the radio. And I have K-Love now playing uh, on the radio. So, you know, you wake up to some song, and uh, you guys you know, you know that song? I think we sing it sometimes here as well. Uh, beautiful things. I make beautiful things. Uh, you, some of you know this song. Well, the very first few words of that song say, all this pain. That's what played. The radio turns on, the alarm goes off, and, and Cheryl wakes up to all this pain. <laughs> That's how many of us feel today. All this pain. Uh, I'm really glad uh, you guys have come out uh, to join us for um, our kickoff of the new year and the ending of Angry Birds. This is the last Sunday of our Angry Birds series, uh, and it's also the last Sunday, uh, where we cover the chronological Bible readings that many of you have been uh, uh, joining us, participating in for one year, since January 1st of last year. Uh, and so, have you guys had some fun with Angry Birds, I hope? Have you enjoyed the series, at least a little? Yeah, has it been all right? Because we've had a lot of fun uh, working on it and kind of going through uh, those scriptures and trying to uh, pull out some of these uh, life principles. Uh, it's been a great time. And, uh, you know, for us, we haven't uh, talked about all aspects, of course, of the game, only the ones that would seem helpful for us to teach what it is we wanted to uh, communicate on uh, any given Sunday. There is one element of the game that if you're not a player of it, you may not uh, quite uh, fully grasp, but you've seen it in other kinds of games. When you start playing Angry Birds, it starts at level 1-1. One -one. Level 1-1. One -one. And when you, open, when you start, you have to do a simple thing. You have to kill a pig. That's it. Level 1-1, one -one, you got to kill a pig. First level, super easy. Anyone can do it. Great. Well, then you get level 1-2. And guess what you have to do? You got to kill a pig. And, and then you get level 1-2. Three. Then you make it all the way through level, you know, one dash whatever, 15, 18, and then you get to level two dash one. And guess what you have to do? You got to kill a pig. And you keep doing this over and over and over until you get to the very end, you get to the very last level of that particular game you're playing, and it might be whatever, level 16 dash 16, and you kill that last pig, and you go to bed. And if you're like me, you've set your, your phone uh, to automatically update and you're happy and content that you've killed the last of the pigs, you wake up in the morning and you find out your phone has been updated with a whole new level. And there are more pigs to kill. And of course, since I enjoy the game, it is a great thing. Now I'm on level 17-1 and guess what I have to do? I gotta kill a pig. I gotta kill a pig. In fact, we got Joel. This is Joel, a shirt we got uh, from one of our boys. It's an uh, Angry Bird shirt and it says, just one more level. Just one more level, because when you're playing it, that's what you feel like. You're like, I just want to do one more level. I know I'm wasting entirely too much time, but just one, one more level. And if it's fun and you enjoy it, that's great. It can also become a little bit exhausting. In fact, if you were to think about your own life, level 1-1 leading all the way to infinity-infinity, you know they're never going to stop creating levels. As long as they can keep making money off the game, they're just going to keep creating more levels with more pigs that you need to kill. And sometimes life feels this way. Every day we wake up and it's level 15-15 and level 72-158. And we feel like we're living in this Groundhog Day kind of existence over and over. And life can become wearisome. It can become difficult and tiresome. We have the same old struggles, and we get worn down by the same old challenges, and, the, and the, those sicknesses and that suffering that creeps in, the aches and the pains are getting worse, not better. We wake up every single day, and we realize that the old abuses are infecting our new loves. We find out that those predictable patterns are becoming an unbearable monotony, and life is it's just so difficult these days. And we wake up and we're not feeling in any way hopeful or optimistic because it's just exhausting. 
It's just wearisome. And where is the real hope? Now, you know, life is always punctuated by the occasional moments of, of happiness and joy and hope. And that's true. And that's good. And those little things, they sort of help us to hold on a little bit. But, but in the end, many of us feel as if it is this ongoing, weary kind of existence. Level one dash whatever. I just feel like I'm doing the same old thing, killing the same old pigs. You know those pigs often look, the, they're identical, level to level. Some days I think they're the very same pigs. I'm like, didn't I kill you eight levels ago? How in the world are you back? And how often in life we end up killing those old pigs and all of a sudden they're back. And sometimes they're bigger and sometimes they're tougher and sometimes they're better armored and fortified. And this is what we fight against every morning, waking up, going through the same thing. Once in a while, it'll strike me. I'm going through my morning rituals. You know, you got to wake up. You got to do your thing. You all have your patterns and your little, you know, your shave and you, do, you know, you got to brush your teeth and all this. And some days I'm like, really? Again? Every single day? Like, I just got to do this thing? And here I go. I can't take a break from any of them. You guys would let me know. You're like, no, you really should keep showering. You know, it's just, it just comes, it's a tiresome kind of an existence sometimes. And yet... We come to the end of the scriptures, the book of the Revelation, and what we begin to see there is, is an entirely new message, something that almost doesn't seem to fit with what we've been reading the entire year. We come to the end and we realize that Christ restores our hope and our joy, that he is, in fact, the one that we can center it upon. And not only does he restore it, but he gives us a taste of our ultimate delight, our ultimate delight. He'll give us even a taste of it here and now. We're opening up uh, in a Bible, if you would, to Revelation chapter 5, starting in verse 1. We're only going to look at one chapter of uh, the Revelation this morning. You know, Revelations can be, the, it's considered to be the hardest book of the Bible, and it's also considered by many to be the easiest to understand. They say that it is so simple that a child can read it and get the main point, and so difficult that a scholar could drown in it. I think that's true. And I think this this morning, because many of you seem a bit hungover, we're going to pick the easy fruit from the book of Revelations. <laughs> we're going to pick those things which are just a little bit simpler, but a little bit more grand. And the picture of, that it paints is an overall gist. And I think chapter 5 gives us a great summary of the rest of the book. Starting in... Uh, Verse 1, chapter 5. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. In some way, the hopes, the future, and the dreams of humanity are wrapped up in this scroll, and John just somehow knows it. We don't even understand why he's so passionate about seeing the scroll open, but he knows it has to be. He knows that next chapter must be open, and it must be fulfilled, and because no one is found who is worthy to do it, he weeps. He weeps and he weeps. No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside. I wept and wept because no one was found worthy. You know, I think in this world, joy leaks. It leaks out of our lives. We've seen this in the chronological Bibles. We started at, at January 1st last year in the book of Genesis. And we had this beautiful picture of the garden. And it wasn't a day before we messed it up. We were in the, the very second day of the year, and all of a sudden humanity is being plunged into this rebellion and this abyss. We're, we're kicked out of Eden. We violate the, the, the arrangement that God had. We jeopardize our relationship with him. And God begins this plan of, of working throughout humanity to pull us back. And we, get, we go into some dark days. These are the days, if you remember the flood, God just regretted humanity. He regretted the making of humanity because we had been so inclined toward evil. Joy had leaked out of the human existence. We see very quickly that the Tower of Babel becomes this mighty moment where humanity is working together. And we use that moment of cooperation and collaboration to shake our fist at God, our creator, to disobey him and to challenge him as sovereign ruler of this world. And he turns around and and gives us what we deserved 
because joy had leaked out of the human condition. God raises up Abraham and there's these moments of hope where he says, You'll be, you will bless the whole world. Because of you, Abraham, everyone in the world will be blessed. And Abraham gives birth to Isaac and Isaac to Jacob and Jacob becomes Israel. The 12 tribes come out of Israel, including Judah. And we're told in Judah that a great king would rise up from the tribe of Judah. This is a fantastic promise. This is a, a moment of, of hope. And then we look at Judah's life. Wow, what a screw up. How many terrible things ended up happening because of Judah. He never fulfilled, it seemed, the things that he was supposed to fulfill. Tamar was, was declared more righteous than even him, this prince of the nation of Israel. And on and on we go until a moment comes after this dark days of the judges when a king arises, King David. Wow, what, what great hope and optimism. And the nation is united and his son Solomon brings in this golden era. And there's no more war and there's just this, this amazing prosperity. It looks for a moment like the promises are being fulfilled and captured for us until it all gets screwed up. Not a, under its own weight, the nation begins to collapse and civil war erupts and then the foreign nations start to invade. And then we get into that era of the prophets where they keep warning the people, stop rebelling against God. You're going to die. Stop rebelling. And we went, in, for us, it was the summer. It was a rough summer. We were reading day after day after day, all of these prophets and all of their weeping and all of their tears. Those were tough days. There was no hope left. And ultimately, the nation was destroyed sent into foreign lands and wiped out and the temple itself was destroyed. This is why we weep, because joy has leaked out of humanity. When uh, John, you know, comes to this place, you know, we, it resonates with us now. We've, we've read these stories, even in the New Testament. Many of the letters of the New Testament are written by the apostles to correct the problems in the early church. You guys notice that, I'm sure, as you've been reading through. He's correcting problems left and right. What's going on? Where is the hope in any of this? We see this in society. Even today, uh, if you look at all, you know, end of year statistics they always give us. This year, 73% of people think the country is on the wrong track. 47% of people think the worst is yet to come. 39% think that we are in a permanent decline. 48% have become completely disillusioned with the American dream. 32% have stopped listening to my statistics already. Just seeing if any of you are still with me here. A couple of you are. All right, good. I'm glad to see that. See, we now, we have lost the innocence of Eden. And because we've lost this innocence, every good thing can be bad. Every good thing can be bad. This was the year, 2011, where we found out that multivitamins do more harm than good. You guys remember this? It was a big news report. Multivitamins, women who take multivitamins, more likely to die than women who don't. They do more harm than good. See, everything good can be used for bad. This was the year we found out that liposuction doesn't work. Yes, it works on the immediate area, but the body has the ability. You remove it here, and it shows up here. That's what they said. So you liposuction it here, and the body has like a fat memory, and it, redispos it redeposits it. That's bad news. Everything good can become bad. We also found out that despite the horrors of socialism, it seems as if the oppression that would readily come in socialistic circles that we learned over the last century. We found that capitalism seems to have its own problems. We found that no system of government seems to work in a way that, that works for the good of people, regardless of the system. All of them can be corrupted. You see, every good thing can go bad now. Every good thing. We find out the technology that meant to save lives is now being used to kill. We know that a glass of wine to bring a little joy to the heart can end with addiction, can bring heartache and wrecked families. We find out that sex, a gift from God, will be used by powerful men to abuse women and children around the world. All good things in the absence, in this loss of Eden, we find all of these good things used for evil. Joy has leaked out. And now, because of that, it's very easy for us to look at the scriptures and to look to God and, and realize, man, it is harsh. He's harsh. He seems like a God of, of judgment. And this is very often the place where we remain. There's a story 
uh, about a rabbi and a pastor who played, uh, they went out and played around a round of golf, old friends. And uh, this is, you know, obviously rabbis and pastors don't really go out and play golf, so you know where we're heading with this. But so a rabbi and a, and a pastor went out to play golf, and they're out there playing golf, and the rabbi takes a shot, swings with all of his might, totally misses. He says, damn, I missed. The, the pastor, he's just, he's shocked. He's, he's rabbi. You can't use language like that. That's totally inappropriate. Well, you know, he's, oh, you're right, you're right. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Takes his next shot, misses completely. Damn, I missed. This goes on and on. The pastor's getting really frustrated. He keeps saying, you cannot use language like that. That is totally inappropriate. You're a man of the cloth. For crying out loud, you cannot do this. All, finally, you know, one big swing, a big miss, same thing. Damn, I missed. The pastor says, you know what? God is going to strike you down. You keep up with this terrible language. He's going to strike you down. Sure enough, next hole. Rabbi swings. He misses. He curses again. The clouds form. It's darkness. And all of a sudden, the rumbling starts. And, and a single lightning bolt breaks out of the clouds, heads right for the golf course, and kills the pastor. And a low voice from heaven says, damn, I missed. <laughs> Because, of course, all we think about with God now is his willingness to damn us. He's that God of judgment. He's the God who is going to condemn and smite. He's going to send that wrath for big violations, for small violations. If, if I'm not quite good to my family, if I'm not a good parent, if I, if I haven't been faithful, he's going to damn me to hell. That's what's going to end up happening because this is a harsh and joyless world. And the church has become the leading proponent of this idea. The church has become known as the, the group of folks who are opposed to all things pleasurable. Because we know that these things can be used for evil, we have all but abandoned the joy and the delight that comes with the good gifts of God. And now we turn around and we warn against every sort of pleasure and we become known primarily as the people who stand against those things, against money and sex and ambition, against all of these things that are so natural and can be so good, we stand against them because we know that they can come to evil. And so humanity weeps. Now look at verse 5. The angel, the elder, is going to have none of this. Chapter 5, verse 5, he says, Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth you see Christ restores all things he restores all things in this little text he's called the lion of the tribe of Judah where Judah fell this king will not fail he's called the root of David not you know he was one of David's children one of David's descendants he's a branch of David but you see, they get it right. They know that he's not the branch. He's the root. In all the ways that David failed, this one won't. He isn't the branch. He's not, he's not dependent upon it. He is the root. He is the source of all of that goodness that came in the time of David. That was his role. And of course, he's called the lamb that was slain. In this little passage, we get the entire trinity. They talk about the seven seals, the seven eyes, the seven, the seven spirits. Most of the scholars say this is the perfect spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. So we have God the Father sitting. We have the, the Holy Spirit as a part of the source of the power and the energy. And of course, we have the Lamb that was slain, the Son. And in the fullness of the Trinity, we see the goodness of God being reclaimed and restored in this earth. He is both the source of good and he is the redeemer of evil. He is the one who takes good out of of the evil. You know, you might think of all the good in this world, those little tastes that we get every now and then, 
They are often unexplainable philosophically, why many of these things even exist. And those little bits of good are evidence to us that the world is dominantly, was meant dominantly to be good. It was meant to be good. Now it might be a wreck, but it was meant to be good. And that good for us is the promise of a future. It's hope to us. It's almost a deposit letting us know what the world ought to have been like and what it will be like at one point in our future. You know, 2011 was also a good year. This was also the year that we found out that chocolate improves your cardiovascular health. How could it get any better than that? Except that they found out that coffee can ward off depression. I mean, chocolate, coffee, this was a good year. We should be taking note of these things. You know, this is also, of course, the year where they found out that music lights up the same parts of the brain as sex. Can you believe this? The same parts, same dopamine, same chemicals. That's pretty fantastic. I mean, this is a good thing for us. We can look back at 2011 and realize that if you tell me that a banana can reduce a stroke, that's what they told us in 2011. A banana can reduce a stroke. A banana is like, a can it's like God's candy bar. It comes with its own wrapper and everything. <laughs> Bananas are amazing. Oh, now, yeah, eat them for your health. Enjoy them. Chocolate, coffee, bananas. This is fantastic music. This is great. We forget how good this world can be. There's a story. Um, 83-year-old Paul Trito of Kansas City. He tied the knot. 83-year-old man. He tied the knot with 96-year-old Fern Schur in 2011. He said, suddenly, there she was. And it became evident that she was the one I wanted to be with. It's never too late. You're never too old. Isn't that so sweet? 93-year-old guy, 93-year-old woman, 96-year-old woman, 83-year-old guy. Because you're never too old to love. Love is enduring like that. You're never too old. You see, this is a good year. Just for that, it was a good time. It was a good thing. Woody Allen, of course, he says, love is the answer, which we know. Love is the answer. Almost every question can be answered with love. But he also goes on to say, Woody Allen, but while you're waiting for the answer, sex raises some pretty good questions. I, mean, I think is also true. There are some really good questions that are raised about, you guys hear that study that came out in 2011? They finally did figure out how many times a day that men think about sex. Remember this? Remember, there's, there's an old mythology out there that they, like, some men think about it, like hundreds and hundreds. It's not true. They've, they've done a more con conclusive study. Anybody want to guess how many times a day a man thinks about sex? Yeah, you see that? No, that's the old stuff. You see, this has all been debunked now. 19 times a day. 19 times a day. Women, anybody want to guess how often women do? Oh, cynical. Oh, that hurts. Oh, two. No, 10. Which is not nearly as different as you might think. 19 versus 10. Now you've come to church, you're having a whole lot more numbers in your head. You're like, wait, now it's got to be like, now I'm like, like 40 today already. But why? This is, it raises a good question. Why? Why do we, have, why 19? Why 10? As often as we think about good food and enjoyable times, why? Because it's fun. Why? Why is it fun? Couldn't we have procreated without the fun? Wouldn't we have done it because of necessity anyway? Why is it that we have taste buds for our food? Lots of organisms can process their nutrients without taste buds. Why do we have them? Why do our eyes see beauty and why do our hearts leap for joy? Why is it that music makes us sing and dance? See, there is good in this world. That was the dominant design. That was the way it ought to have been. And too often, we begin to forget. You know, this isn't just... Uh, a world filled with heartache. It is a world filled with a, a thousand delights. Things that are good and are meant to, to sustain and fill us up. You know, a friend of mine, she sat down in 2011, she decided to make up a list of not all the things that went wrong, but of the, the 15 firsts that she had for 2011. What an awesome exercise to think about how good your year had been and how hopeful it will be in the future. You know, he is also, of course, the God that not only is the maker of all of that good, not only is he responsible for all of that, but he is the God who alone takes good out of evil. That's the story of the cross, of course.
the death of Christ for the redemption of humanity. The lamb that was slain, as John calls him. He takes good out of evil. I've been reading a book this week, G.K. Chesterton. Um, he, He explains it sort of like this. He says that the modern age is an age of sadness. It's an age of sadness. And what we need aren't the prophets of old, not the prophets of old who used to tell people, you're going to die. Not the prophets of old who used to say, you're about to be destroyed. But they need a new prophet. They need a prophet that will tell them, you're not dead yet. You're not dead yet. That there is hope and there is a future and there is a a potential for the blessing of God and for the joys and the delights, even in the midst of pain, a comfort that transcends understanding. You see, they need a prophet. They need prophets who will rise up and face this age of sadness with an optimism that comes from a good God. We're told that we will be a kingdom of priests, kingdom and priests in this way, so that the Abrahamic promise of blessing all of the world will ultimately be fulfilled, and it will be fulfilled in our lives. Look at uh, verse 11. Then I looked and heard the voice of, ma- voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and in a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, Be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures and said, Amen. And the elders fell down and they worshiped. See, the end of this story is certain. The end of this story is certain. We already know how this game ends. The, uh, it was the uh, University of uh, California in San Diego. They did a study on the uh, people's responses to mysteries. Now, if you're you're a mystery lover, if you like movies and and books about mysteries, this might surprise you. I always assumed that at the end, you don't want to know what's going to happen. You don't want to to spoil it, right? You don't want to find out what's going to happen before you get there. You want to experience it, how it was written. They found out that that's not actually true. They found out that people enjoy a mystery more when they already know how it's going to end. Isn't that interesting? They had 12 short stories. They had a large group of people. And each of them, uh, and all sorts, of Christ, uh, all, all sorts of authors, Agatha Christie, Raymond Carver, Anton Chekhov, and they came with, a, they, they, had, they set it up in a few different ways so that the spoiler was evident before some of the, the control groups started. And what they discovered is that for some reason, the pleasure that, pe- that readers get from a good story, researcher Jonathan Levitt tells us at uh, BBC News, it has far more to do with the quality of the writing and the character development than with the nail-biting plot. It has more to do, the experience, the joy you get out of the story is more intense because of the quality of the writing, not because of the nail-biting plot. And once a reader knows how a story turns out, Levitt says, he or she can focus on a deeper understanding of the story. Isn't that fascinating? There's a spoiler in the Bible. He tells us how it's going to end. And because of that, the angst and the despair and the anxiety are supposed to leak out. The joy can be sustained. Now we can look for what he says, the deeper meaning the character development. Now we can look to those things in the story and enjoy those things. Now the mystery doesn't become debilitating. It becomes enjoyable once again. And it ought to be enjoyable because we already know how it's going to end. Christ wins. Christ wins. And because he wins, we win. His followers win. And ultimate good wins. And all wrongs will be made right. In the end, this game will most certainly end. And there are none who ought to be more hopeful and more joy-filled than the followers of Christ, who ought to be able to smile more quickly, to, to sing and to dance and to rejoice and to enjoy each other, to enjoy the goodness of this world. There ought to be none who can do that so quickly and so readily as the follower of Christ who knows how this story ends. We will all worship like the elders, like the the four living creatures. We will all worship and we will sing his praises 
Because one day the game ends. There will not be another level. We will all die. You know, there's a story of two guys, they go to heaven. They died. And when they get to heaven, God says, I'm sorry, it's, your, your home's not quite ready. We just need to send you back for just, you know, a little while, half a day or so, until we finish up your homes. Great, that sounds fantastic. And by the way, you can go back as anything you want for this half a day. That's it, just, you know, anything you want. You just tell us. And the one guy says, you know what, I've always wanted to fly. So I want to be an eagle flying over some majestic landscape. God says, excellent, great choice, done, poof. Guy disappears. The next guy says, you know what, my whole life I've been kind of a, kind of a nerd. And I would just, even for a little bit, I would love to go back as just one really cool stud. God says, done, poof. So half a day later, you know, their homes are ready for them. And so God sends an angel to go get them. And he says, they're going to be easy to find. One guy is an eagle flying over the Grand Canyon, majestic in all of his glory. And the other guy is on a snow tire in Detroit. One cool stud, do you get it? I mean, you guys are sleeping. All right, maybe I shouldn't use that at 11.30. Uh, so, <laughs> one cool stud. All right, and so, <laughs> so, whether or not you've lived this life as an eagle, or whether you have been stuck on a tire in Detroit somewhere. This doesn't actually matter in the end. You already know how this story ends. You will be received by God into an eternal home. You will be loved by him in a way that the human soul longs for and it craves and we desire. We will in fact remember that we in this game, we're the bird. God is the player. Has it dawned on us yet? God is the one in control of this game. You're not the one playing over and over. You're just the bird. God is the mysterious and invisible force. And remember, it's the slingshot, is the power of the Holy Spirit. And it wouldn't be the first time that humanity was saved from a piece of wood. And that, for us, is the hope that we now have. This doesn't have to bring us down and break our spirits. We have more hope and more optimism and more potential for the future than anyone in earth has ever had. That ought to be who we are and what marks us. When Christ wins, we win. And so this upcoming year as a church, we're going to be going after this idea. You know, last year we announced the Chronological Bible was sort of our theme for the year. This year, uh, we're going to be focusing on fewer texts, but going deeper. We're going to be looking at taking a handful of scriptures maybe even some of the most familiar uh, and popular. And we're going to be pressing deeper into them. And we're, when we go deeper into them, we're going to be looking to try to memorize some of God's word this year. We're going to be reading the book of Philippians. Instead of reading it with 15 other chapters, we're going to read it maybe five or six or eight times, maybe 10 times, to really let it sink in. We're going to go deeper into, a fewer, te into fewer texts. And by doing that, we're going, to be, we're going to be trying to strengthen our core. You know, this is the beginning of the new year, physical training. It's a big part of what we're supposed to be. You know, we all make these resolutions. And they always tell you in physical training, it's the core, right? You've got to strengthen the core. That's what really matters. Some of you saw that poster. Our, that's our series coming up starting next week, P, P90S. P90S. That's going to be our series starting up. You saw that? I know many of you ladies checked out that poster coming in because there's like a half-naked man on it, and he looks really good. And so now you're going to check it out on your way out, and there goes your number 10. You're going to be up at 15. But so, you know, this is why, because in the same way you need the core training for your physical life, you need core training for your soul. You need to strengthen that through the understanding of the spiritual disciplines, through worship and Bible reading and, uh, and through meditation. We're going to look at how to strengthen our spiritual core. And we're going to take a look at our relationships. We're going to figure out how do we broaden them? How do we add more significant relationships? And how do we take the relationships we have and make them deeper? How do we make them deeper? How do we figure out how to connect more fully and completely? We're going to take a, a, a long look at how to serve in more sacrificial ways with joy in our hearts, how to help others find and reach their full potential in the kingdom of God. And we're going to take time to figure out what it means to commit ourselves more wholeheartedly Individually, each one of us taking the necessary, the necessary steps to ramp up our commitment to our spiritual journeys. That's what we're going to be doing for 2012. And the only way that this will, will work for us is if we realize that he is a good God and that these things are designed for our ultimate joy and delight. We're going to, take, we're going to try to, 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 to drink in the most amount 
of, of delight in God that we possibly can. That's what 2012 will be about, and I hope you guys will participate with us in it all year. Would you pray with me? Lord, we ask uh, that you would uh, fill us up here at the beginning of the year. Help us to see that the good in this world is from you. That, Lord, um, you have uh, gone to great lengths uh, to make this world uh, a spectacular experience for us. There's no reason we ought to take such comfort in our friends. There's no reason we uh, ought to love uh, our children uh, so desperately. It's not every creature that is like this. There's no reason we ought to see beauty and appreciate it and, and, and uh, enjoy the tastes um, and the smells, the sounds of this world. But you've wired it in such a way for that to be true, to give us a taste of, of just how good you are. I pray, Lord, that this year we would, we would pursue you with all of our, heart, our hearts, our minds, our souls, our strength, so that we might see, taste and see just how good you are. And take great hope in the promise of the scriptures that in the end, all of these hurts, all of this wearisome will come to an abrupt and final end. And all that will be left is our journey with you, our joy-filled, delight-filled walk with you. In Christ's name we pray, amen.